Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Aura, the all-in-one application that protects your safety online powered by AI. Honestly, it is worse to just be a human that exists on the internet from a safety perspective than it ever has been before. I'm constantly getting weird scam phone calls from everyone. I'm sure you guys do too. There are lots of weird phishing attempts that are made to internal employees at Blockworks and on Twitter. So I have to do these posts that, hey, I'll never ask you for money. It just is terrible. The actual statistics is that one in four people now fall victim to cybercrime. And if you operate in crypto, it is even worse. You are more at risk. That's why we're happy to partner up with Aura here. And I'm going to be telling you all about them later in the show. Hey, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Mantra, the security-first, compliance-focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the show. But for now, Mantra, thanks for making this episode possible. All right, everyone. We've got a lot of ground to cover here. Super excited about this chat. Uh, before we get into it, can we just start with a super quick round of intros, maybe 10 or 15 seconds about who you are and what you're doing? Matt. Sure. Matt Hogan. I'm the CIO at Bitwise Asset Management in the U.S. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Sunshine. I'm the CEO of Grayscale Investments. Hey, everyone. I'm Tony Ashraf, and I run Digital Asset Transformation for BlackRock. Good morning. My name is Leo Marshall. I'm the CEO for Galaxy in Europe. Awesome. Guys, I want to start actually with the, the high level and the sort of um, basically year-to-date performance on these ETFs. We have nine new uh, ETFs, which are being called the Newborn Nine, right, <laughs> by the guys at Bloomberg. Um, can we just, for folks who are in the audience and might not know these, some of these numbers off the top of their head, what has the performance been like in terms of just um, net inflows, the amount of assets that are held in these Bitcoin ETFs? And frankly, has it surprised you, the, the performance so far? Sure, I'll jump in. These are the most successful ETF launches ever in the U.S. by a large margin. Uh, so how about that? Uh, before these, the, the fastest growing ETF in one year was the NASDAQ 100 Qs, which pulled in $5 billion. And these ETFs, I've even checked recently, it must be $10, $11, 12000000000 billion net Easily. in two months. So in two months, they've done what other ETFs did in a year. Uh, and I think those flows are going to accelerate. So it's far exceeded my expectations. And, you know, I came from the ETF industry. So it's been pretty great. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, you know, this has been a journey my company has been on for the better part of the last 10 years. Um, and to see not only kind of crypto native, crypto specialist firms like Grayscale and Bitwise in the arena, but also folks like BlackRock and others, uh, some of the world's largest asset managers coming into the space is really validating to the asset class as a whole. Um, What I would say is really important kind of being here in London, kind of mid-March, about a month away from the next Bitcoin halving. I'm curious for the rest of the panel's thoughts on this as well. We kind of feel like we're in this in-between phase in terms of adoption, growth, and usage of Bitcoin ETFs. And that's to say that there was a lot of pent up demand uh, for these products to come into market. As Matt just shared, there's been explosive growth into all of these products over the last, actually we forget, it's only been about nine weeks, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, And so we're now in that little bit of an in-between phase where maybe the pent up demand has really been satisfied um, and we're about to leg into that next phase of growth where you're going to start seeing a lot more institutional usage of these products, a lot more financial advisory, registered investment advisors, wealth platforms, folks that are looking for products to be approved on their platforms, which we actually think is probably the next phase of growth, the next group of users to start allocating to these products. And we're just in that in-between phase. So it could actually even coincide with the, with the Bitcoin halving. I'll just add to um, to what Michael said. So, I mean, what's going to be interesting to see is the 13F report. You know, at the end of Q1, you get to see who a lot of these major investors in the ETF have been. Um, but one thing I've noticed is that we've mainly seen self-directed brokerages, RIAs, independent advisor networks getting involved now. And then we're going to see a sort of six to 12 month slow on ramp of many of the smaller RAs who have done their due diligence and come to folks uh, like, like the issuers here and say, look, we've got clients who want to get exposure. One thing I think we haven't spoken about so far is some of the impact of the ETF uh, on the sales and trading side. So my background is sales and trading and the market structure has completely changed. And we can talk about what that means, but, but at a very high level, both liquidity and volatility over time is going to fundamentally and structurally change. What it means for the Bitcoin brokerage space, it means that now we have the ability to finance things cheaper with ETFs and trade ETF options. 
but I think it will probably change the cyclicality of the Bitcoin industry. So what that means is maybe slightly less Bitcoin, ETH, altcoins as a rotational cycle, and maybe you see a cyclicality which is more driven by when next ETF, for example. And, and, to, and, to, and to Michael's point, uh, you know, what, what are the stop gaps in, the, in that adoption? That will probably drive the nature of cycles going forward. And I would, I would perhaps, sorry, just, just to add and, and maybe give a slightly different context. And I'm sure like the rest of the panelists can't specifically talk about the products in the US, but just in terms of what we're seeing is like, I think one of the key dynamics we're seeing is a rebalancing, right? So we're seeing a rebalancing from other products into the ETFs. We're starting to see existing investors move into ETFs, perhaps just from a convenience perspective. And the other key thing that I think we're obviously seeing is, is new investors coming into the space because ETFs provide just this new level of access for many investors into this space. And I think as Michael said, what, what we're really seeing over the past couple of months is, is that pent up demand being satisfied because of the ETFs providing this new level of access. So I think it's really important just to think about it through that context. The other piece I would just add in terms of just some of the factors that have got us here, right, which I think is just important for the audience to think about. So when we look at it, we've always looked at it through the lens of our clients and what our clients are asking for. And that narrative over the past couple of years has is, is really shifted and continued to evolve. And we're, we're at a point where there's really three key areas that we continue to see driving some of the demand and just the dynamics in this space. One is just the, the macroeconomic environment, right, the change in demographics in terms of wealth, we're seeing obviously geopolitical tensions, inflation and so on. So that theme continues. Secondly, there's a maturation of the ecosystem, which I think is really important. And that's seeing more venture funds coming in. We have more traditional providers entering this space. And also interestingly, simple things like so custody is becoming more secure. And then lastly, we have just the, the regulatory environment, which is still got a long way to perhaps go, but is continuing to provide more certainty and clarity in terms of how we operate in this space, which I think is really important for the future as well. So as much as I think we are still at early stages in terms of what all this means, I think it's just a really interesting part of the, the cycle that we're in. So much to unpack there. Hey everyone, we partnered with Aura for this episode to keep on the margin listeners safe from cybercrime. I talked about it at the top of this episode, but cybercrime and phishing scams have basically become the bane of my existence. I get 10 spam calls every single day, every day. I'm sure you guys do too. And my co-founder Yano has actually been hacked multiple times, you know, knock on wood, God forbid this past year. So it's just never been less safe to operate on the internet, especially if you work in crypto, it's particularly tough. That's why we partnered up with Aura, which is an all-in-one app that provides protection for your identity, financial accounts, passwords, devices, all of that stuff. Now, the benefit of Aura, there are many benefits, but one, it's AI, so you immediately get notifications if someone is trying to hack into your bank account, social media, whatever it is, so you know really quick. But in addition to that, what they do is they will actually help you solve the problem. So with 24 seven US based support and dedicated resolution agents, or will actually be there every step of the way to help you resolve whatever is happening on the fraud front. And for a limited time, because Aura just loves on the margin and you guys as listeners, uh, we are getting a free 14 day trial plus 55% off an Aura subscription when you visit aura.com slash blockworks. Only get that discount if you go to aura.com slash blockworks which we've linked in the description. So go check them out. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Mantra, the security first compliance focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions into Web3. So you guys heard me talk about Larry Fink talking about tokenization. You've seen the clips on CNBC. You know that Larry and BlackRock are very, very excited about this idea. And the reason for that is they're looking at these trillions of dollars of off-chain real world assets. They wanna digitize those and bring them on chain, which is gonna be a massive opportunity but in order to do that, they need a compliant L1, and that's where Mantra comes in. Mantra has been steadily climbing the ranks and now stands among the top four RWA projects on CoinGecko, which is representative of its rapid growth and influence in the tokenization space. Mantra is built using the Cosmos SDK, so they have some very cool stuff out of the box. They've got IBC interoperability. They also leverage Cosmwasm smart contracts. Very cool design from an architectural standpoint. The next phase on the blockchain's testnet is Hongbai, so that's launching soon. So if you're uh, a dApp developer or something like that, there's a lot of very cool opportunities for you. And I highly recommend that you click the link at the bottom of the show notes. I don't know that I sent you. Uh, thanks very much again, Mantra, for making this possible. And again, guys, click the link at the bottom of the show notes. I want to start with um, actually helping to contextualize some of the inflows that we've been seeing thus far. So 
Uh, I think that $12 billion number is roughly right um, based on the day, which is enormous. And if you've been following these on a day-to-day basis, which you can do on some uh, resources like farside.uk, uh, you can actually see on some days there are 600 million. I think we had a $1 billion net inflow day. And I think the question that a lot of investors and industry participants are asking themselves is, is this sustainable? And then quickly after, where are these net inflows coming from? Any color that y'all can add? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to start. So, um, I mean, the, the impact that we've seen so far is, is pretty seismic. Um, and I think it's fair to say exceeds pretty much everyone's expectations. I mean, back in 2021, you, there were actually a lot of wealth management platforms that had a lot of pent up demand for exposure to Bitcoin, but they really just didn't have the tools to do it. They didn't have a wrapper, which they were accustomed to. So there, you saw a lot of private placement funds with sort of 75 page documents, a lot of friction around the interaction with that, a lot of friction around redemption. And that's now been replaced with, an, with a wrapper, which they're accustomed to and used to. So the demand was there. What you're seeing now is the very early innings of that demand met with, frankly speaking, thousands potentially of salespeople, both across the issuers, but also across the platforms. You're going to see a lot of the white houses engage their sales team. And what you'll eventually see, I think we'll come to realize is maybe the greatest orange pill event of all time where you, you basically have all of ChadFi with a wrapper that they're, that they're used to able to sell to folks. I think that's the reason why you're seeing like extraordinary demand. Um, and, and that's why you see, and I think on that day that you mentioned, I think it was like 14,700 units of Bitcoin got bought in one day. And the emissions for Bitcoin were about 880 units. So I think that's what we're beginning to see. And naturally, a lot of folks will look to get ahead of this. So people will lever up, buy Bitcoin, and it will overshoot. And then it will crash back down, like we saw t- this morning. Um, so I think that will be the way the asset class trades, at least in the near term. Yeah, maybe. And Matt, I know. Could I actually get your expense? I think the wirehouse point and is a really, really critical one. And I think I'm not sure, folks in the audience. You know, how how many of you out there are aware of the wirehouses and sort of distribution system that exists for ETFs? All right, I think it would be really helpful. Maybe you could give us a little bit of a tutorial of what that actually looks like. Because I think everyone sees these ETFs, but what they don't see is these wirehouses that are set up in this massive system of distribution that I think uh, Leon was alluding to. So could you give us a little more color there? Yeah, sure. And, and then I definitely have some thoughts on whether it's sustainable. If you think about the U.S. retail wealth market, there's sort of two groups. There's RIAs, which you would call IFAs here which are independent financial advisors. And those are the ones that are buying the ETFs now outside of retail because they can make their own decision. And then their major national account platforms like Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch and Wells Fargo and UBS. And they typically, when an ETF launch, can't go out and sell it to their clients. Those advisors are beholden to the platform approving one or more of these ETFs through their own due diligence process. So if you think of like the SEC approving an ETF is getting over one hump, there is another hump or actually a series of smaller um, passageways that the ETFs have to go through before most of the wealth in the U.S. market can buy it. And we're probably a few weeks away from the first of those major wirehouses approving it, Um, maybe, maybe a week away. And uh, within a few months, they'll all be able to approve it. So you should think of the flows we're seeing into these ETFs as like the spigot turned on 20%. And there's another 80% to go. And that process is going to take place for a while. And just just on the sustainability, I mean, there's been a lot of flows. It's $50 billion or something uh, total AUM in these. But global wealth management is a you know, $100 trillion market. Um, and most of that is short Bitcoin at this point because they have no exposure. So I think these could be hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in a couple of years, and I think it will take multiple years before they peak. Yeah, I'd say just one other thing to add on that I don't know that we're spending enough time talking about, so I want to shed a minute or two on it, is all of us are advocating for the introduction and approval of listed options on Bitcoin ETFs, spot Bitcoin ETFs uh, in the U.S., So as many of you know, uh, Bitcoin futures ETFs launched, uh, and I think it was only about a day or so after they launched in the U.S. that listed options were available on Bitcoin futures ETFs. And so what you've seen now is filings from the major three exchanges in the U.S., the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, and the CBOE, all filing applications with 
the SEC to amend their listing rules to allow for listed options on top of spot Bitcoin ETFs. And um, it's a one of those processes that unfortunately we're still in kind of a regulatory holding pattern. Um, but we do think this could be very, very meaningful for the further kind of adoption and maturation of spot Bitcoin ETFs and, and users, right? It could help lead to price discovery. It could help investors manage their positions better. And it could also actually lead to additional product creation, right? Um, you've seen some issuers file for covered call ETFs on top of spot Bitcoin ETFs. Um, so these are the, you know, the kind of next wave of um, potential impacts that we're excited to see, but there will be careful coordination on the listed options between the SEC, the CFTC, and the Options Clearing Corp. Um, that, you know, is something that I hope will occur by Q3, the latest this year, um, and can really, again, be an important catalyst. Uh, just to add to something that Michael said, <clears throat> I think you'll begin to see those additional permutations of the spot Bitcoin ETF uh, as sort of gateway drugs for additional uh, traditional finance participants to get involved in the space and to add further liquidity. So in the, in the, you know, in the very near term, you see a lot of folks getting involved with arbitrage plays, for example, between the ETF and spot Bitcoin, between CME. Um, but, and then once they have those pipes and rails set up, they'll be able to participate in other products. And then just to add to, to something that Matt said, um, you know, a, a lot, there 46, uh, there's 46 trillion US dollars in the, in the wealth management platform industry in the US. And that is managed by 62% of those are baby boomers or, or, or older. And so a lot of those folks aren't using Robinhood as their platform. And so as these new spigots uh, get opened up, you would expect a new type of client segment to get involved, a, slightly, a, a crowd which is slightly more mature, perhaps. And, you know, we, and we've seen that, um, you know, uh, you know, Galaxy uh, is partnered with Invesco, uh, is running its own spot ETF, um, and uh, Cetera, which is a $190 billion wealth platform, approved uh, Invesco as one of the four uh, ETFs on its platform more recently. And so I think you'll begin to see more of that over time, and, and you'll see a new type of client segment get involved as well. Yeah, I think uh, this point of distribution, I just want to underline it because I think it's so important because there are so many questions around whether or not these flows are ultimately sustainable or not. There's a, maybe some of you guys read Matt Levine over at Bloomberg, but he wrote this great piece uh, about brokerages as investment stores a long time ago. And it's much easier to think about this from the perspective of you're making like a real, not that financial products aren't real, but like an actual product. And maybe you get into like your local toy store uh, and that's great distribution. But I feel like Bitcoin for so long was kind of at our local toy store and it was available, but it was difficult to get. And now it just moved into Walmart. Um, and has been rolled out to 3,000 stores across the country. And I think that is a really important uh, framework to understand when you're thinking about whether or not these flows are sustainable. Leon, you know, I, I want to ask you about a point that you made about whether or not this is going to change the cycle, right? This is the classic four-year cycle, which is around the ha uh, anchored around the halving, which we're about 30 days out from uh, almost exactly today. Um, and you mentioned maybe the introduction of these Bitcoin ETFs actually changing this really empirically observable pattern that we've been going through for the last 15 years. Can you guys respond to that? Like, do you think that this ultimately ends up changing things? Um, there was a period of time where it looked like Bitcoin was uh, walking uh, stepwise up forever. We're down about 15% or something like that <laughs> from the all-time highs. What do you guys think about uh, the impact that these products are going to have ultimately on the cycle? I mean, I'll just quickly say, like, it's, it's a use case for Bitcoin that didn't really exist, right? Um, you know, up until now, to Leon's point, you know, you had private placements, um, which was, you know, an on-ramp for folks to get invested in crypto or get invested in Bitcoin. You certainly had people buying and selling Bitcoin through wallets, exchanges, order books. But, you know, now there's this entirely new set of receptacles that hold Bitcoin. And so while that doesn't necessarily make Bitcoin any more useful, it does continue to make Bitcoin investable. Um, and so it obviously is having already, I think, a pretty quick impact on the Bitcoin supply. I think now it's in excess of 4% of the outstanding Bitcoin resides in U.S. listed ETFs. So I think it's kind of hard to ignore that. I agree. It could have a pretty meaningful impact on, on those dynamics. I think it changes it in two ways. Uh, one, I think alt season is driven by a wealth effect. People make money in Bitcoin, they get rich, and then they spill over looking for more speculative investments. The same thing you see in equities. People make money in large caps, and then they go to small caps and venture. 
And I think we might see an everything season instead of an alt season because there's so much new money flowing into the Bitcoin ETFs that it's it's filling the bucket faster than the alt outflow can go. And historically, that wasn't the case. So I expect more of an everything season than an alt season and a rotation. Uh, and I think the wealth effect will be really large because I think a lot of wealth will be made in Bitcoin. I do think it can sh- temper it make the cycle a little bit more temperate. Because the, the other thing that people overlook about these new investors into Bitcoin is that they invest money every year. They invest money for their retirement. They invest money as their you know taxable savings. There's more regular investment than who we've historically seen from the retail investors who got us to this point. So I think slightly lower volatility, more rebalancing. Um, but I still think we'll be cyclical, right? I still think, you know, Next year will be an amazing, exuberant year, and then there's likely to be a pullback. But it's going to be attenuated in an important way. But, you know, Matt, what's interesting about the alt season versus everything season is that historically, if someone was making a lot of money on Bitcoin price appreciation, they'd still be within crypto natively itself and could, you know, swap from Bitcoin into an altcoin. And now if a lot of that wealth is tied up in ETFs, um, then are they selling an ETF to get back to cash to then get, you know, back into, you know, crypto native assets and whether that's stable coins or, you know, directly buying um, coins directly, holding them directly. So I do think it will continue to shift. But I think the fact that some of that's now being created within the ETFs itself does change the dynamic. Mm -hmm. I would perhaps just add, I mean, I don't think we can underestimate just the impact and that change in demographic in terms of who's ultimately in these products now in, in, in Bitcoin. Because if you think about it, what, at least in my view, what Bitcoin ETFs have essentially done is they have ushered in just a whole new era of access, right? And that will peripherally across both traditional investors as well as into the kind of crypto native side of things more and more. But the key piece is some of the forces that brought us here, right? When you think about just the macroeconomic side of things, inflation and so on, none of that's fundamentally changing. So we have a really interesting dynamic where you have obviously this pent up demand, supply being constrained, and we have a whole new demographic investors coming into this space that have a different way of perhaps buying and holding and using the ETF structure in terms of long-term investment opportunities, right? So that demographic, I think, does start to change the cycle a little bit, which is, I think, something that we really need to think about. I don't think anybody really knows where that lands, but I don't think we should underestimate just that demographic change and what it means for the future. I'll, I'll just add to that one last bit, which is a lot, a lot of folks who invest through their RA are not going to at market sell when the price comes lower 10%. And I think that might be a, in itself a structural change. Something which I haven't, I, I, I heard this mentioned on, a, on a, a report some time ago, and I haven't heard it mentioned much since, but there's, to Matt's point, there's also like a wealth effect. If, you, if your Bitcoin is denominated in shares within an issuer, it, it, you know, I think on balance, folks might both be more interested in investing and less interested in, in at market selling. Because instead of owning 0. 0.40s worth of a Bitcoin, you actually have X number of shares. And, and the de- denomination matters. I mean, that's why a lot of, the, a lot of coins denominate themselves with you know, you know, fantastic numbers of digits, it's because it actually <laughs> makes an impact. So I think those those are two things, and and you know the third thing I'd say is that, uh, that g- going forward, a, a lot of the folks who are investing in the space now, we're, we're talking about RAAs, we're talking about major white houses, but as liquidity changes and, and and increases, it should then attract newer segments, right? So you know what we haven't mentioned so far is is corporates, we haven't mentioned sovereign wealth, we haven't mentioned eventually central banks. And they're only going to be interested in an asset class once it reaches a certain, you know, assets under management. So, so Bitcoin does benefit from an effect of, you know, the bigger it gets, the more attractive it becomes as an asset class for new client segments. It unlocks new sets of investors. And I think that unit bias that you're describing is extremely real. Uh, Tony, I want to zoom in on a point that you're making about this new demographic that's coming into the space. Just on this theme of, okay, we've got the Bitcoin ETFs, which we're all very excited about, but what comes next? You know, I think, one of the things that people are starting to focus on now that we have Bitcoin spot ETFs is, is there going to be an ETH spot ETF? Um, and there's been a lot of speculation around that. So I'm curious, A, how realistic this panel thinks that is, 
But B, is there going to be the same type of appetite on the institutional side that there was for Bitcoin? I mean, I mean, I certainly hope so. Uh, in in Europe, um, you know, on our side, you know, we we've partnered with DWS and will in a matter of weeks be launching new ETP products in Europe. Um, I hope that we'll see newer ETFs as well, but you know, I can't speak to that. Um, what I will say is I expect to see other permutations in this on the spot ETF. And it might be the case in the future that we we look to the SEC to to enable sort of redemptions in kind for the spot ETF. I think that would be a good innovation. Um, but um, you know, th those remain to be seen. The thing which I which I think is like most important is that it's a seismic event, and it's important to have both legislation and regulation around that, both to continue to promote the innovation that folks are sitting here are taking the lead on, uh, as well as consumer protection. I'll take a maybe controversial view. Um, uh, I hope we don't get a ETH ETF in May. Uh, I, I actually sort of want it to be later. Uh, I think it will gather more assets if it launches in December versus if it launches in May. I think Wall Street traditional finance just started ingesting this giant thing called Bitcoin and they're just getting their hands around it. And I think you need to give them longer to digest I don't know. I mean, that won't influence what the SEC decides. But if they do, in fact, push back approval past the May deadline, I think that'll be net good uh, for the crypto industry and ultimately for e ETF flows. I think we need, you know, another eight or nine months of digesting Bitcoin before we're ready for ETH. Um, you know, so we're we're looking at late May as to the first of the final deadlines that the SEC is going to be required to make a decision on spot Ethereum ETFs in the U.S. market. And there's a couple of things that are a little bit different about this decision than it was for spot Bitcoin ETFs. Um, when we look back at the history of spot Bitcoin ETF applications and ultimately their denials uh, from coming to market and came to this most recent series of now finally approvals, what we had in hand was a very good sense of how the regulator was thinking. Um, because for many years, I think they had at that point published over a dozen different denials. And we could see quite clearly what their hangups were about not approving these products. It was about the regulation of the underlying market. Was it susceptible to fraud and manipulation? Things of that nature. And so issuers um, like ourselves and others up here took that upon ourselves to directly you know, work uh, with the SEC, provide educational resources, and do our best to kind of work through those issues to give them the requisite comfort. In the case of spot Ethereum ETFs, we haven't really seen a denial before. Um, but we do know, um, certainly following um, our lawsuit against the SEC, that it was clearly, you know, one of the linchpin kind of core arguments that we had was that there is an inextricable tie and a nearly perfect correlation between the regulated futures market that exists for Bitcoin futures and the underlying spot market, and that the regulator couldn't be providing disparate treatment to two alike issues. And what we've seen now is a very similar, if not, I'm told, almost even stronger series of data um, and correlations between the regulated market for Ethereum, Ethereum futures that are trading well and robustly, uh, on the CME in the US and what that looks like for the spot Ethereum market. Uh, and so we remain optimistic about the prospects of a spot Ethereum product coming to market. I you know, continue to say very often what I said around Bitcoin, it's a matter of when, not a matter of if. Um, and it's just a question of whether or not, you know, by this May, when the SEC has that first deadline, whether the data in front of them will actually be convincing enough. Um, but, you know, we'll have to just wait and see. It's a couple weeks away. Yeah, I mean, the only, I think the, the panelists have, have kind of covered the majority of it. I mean, I can't, again, talk about specific products, but the only other thing I would say is, I mean, we, we'll go where demand is. We, we, we're keen to see in the same way that I think the spot Bitcoin ETF um, has, has really changed the market dynamic, how this manifests itself in other ways. And, and there's a, like, even outside of just the, the standard ETF flow, I think that what people need to think about is, there's a catalyst effect happening here, right? Where we have certain forces that are pushing us towards a, a direction. But also, if you think about, we have traditional finance wrapping crypto in structures like an ETF, and that's driving one dynamic. And then you have 
kind of crypto side of things starting to impact traditional finance through tokenization as well. So the, the one other dynamic that I think is really interesting, even just outside of the, the direct ETF side of things, is how this convergence starts to come together, right? You have these two, a duality between traditional finance and crypto that's starting to manifest itself in a really different way because of the catalyst of the ETFs themselves. And I think because those underlying factors will only continue, we're going to see more of that convergence happen in the future, which I think is just really important when we think about how this evolves. I think actually a lot for exactly what you're describing, basically look at ETFs as a wrapper, tokenization, which is what I think you're alluding to, is also a wrapper. And that's, I think a lot of the ETF issuers just innately kind of clicked and got that uh, a long time ago, although it's admittedly taken a little while to push it through our, our regulators, especially over in the US. I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get at, um, and you know, don't say anything you guys can, of course, but I want to get a sense if, if you guys think there's real demand for other products outside of Bitcoin. You know, this is around the time in the cycle, and especially now that we got the Bitcoin spot ETFs and everyone's super excited about that, you get these people saying, hey, Bitcoin is really the only thing that exists here. That's the thing that institutions are going to be interested in. They're not going to want to move down the spectrum into these other types of products. And I will say, you know, for such, you know, one of the most successful launches, if not the most successful launch in history, you don't have to rewind the clock back that far to see CEOs of banks uh, saying that there was absolutely no client demand for this. And that's the reason that they weren't pushing in. And so I guess I'm just trying to get a sense from you whether or not you think it's realistic or when you think it should get approved. Is there demand for something like an ETH ETF or even moving down the risk into things like Solana or Avalanche or Cosmos or whatever? I mean, all right, I'll take this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure, but I'll be surprised if there isn't. Um, I mean, if you think about it, we've all been in, in this industry for a number of years and you know, at Galaxy, we, we ran our own internal research on what we thought the net demand in ETFs would be by the end of this year. I think the number we came out at was 14 billion, and we've seen 12 already. So it shows how wrong you can be, even being in the absolute inside of the industry. And so I don't see any reason why any other investors and sets of assets, asset managers don't take the same path that all of us have taken most of us have taken, I should say, by seeing, by being both interested in, in BTC and being interested in one part of the space and then being interested in another part of the space. Uh, if you compare it with gold, for example, I think gold, inflation adjusted for its first 40 days of the, of the launch of the gold ETF, you saw around, inflation adjusted around a billion dollars of inflows. But for Bitcoin alone, we've seen 10x that. So is there room for other products? I think there probably is. Yeah, I, I, there's certainly demand for other products. Um, you know, Grayscale now has a family of 17 different digital asset products, both single asset and diversified or thematic in nature. And it has been our experience over the last decade that investors' usual first investment is in Bitcoin. And it's usually, whether it's a combination of price appreciation or the beginning of that kind of wealth creation that causes them to look deeper at crypto, um, or ultimately that wealth creation that says, ooh, maybe I should you know, take some gains and diversify into some other parts of the crypto ecosystem. Um, there is certainly demand across the product spectrum, um, whether it's you know, Solana, whether it's Ethereum, um, whether it's looking at DeFi, like certain segments of the market, they understand increasingly so that there are, there's entire asset class here, that there are, you know, tons of assets within that asset class that don't necessarily compete with one another. They have different addressable markets, different use cases, um, and they all may look and feel and seem similar because they may be blockchain-based tokens, but very quickly investors start to begin to appreciate the difference between proof of work and proof of stake and kind of some of the utilities that are being developed around these. And I also think if for a lot of them, as they have been investing with us over the last you know, eight, nine, 10 years, things that today are very commonplace within crypto are use cases that were never even thought of or even considered, right? We weren't talking about NFTs or ordinals or you know, any of the other types of use cases that we're seeing built on top of some of these protocols. And so whether um, it is a spot Ethereum ETF or whether it is just the continued maturation of this asset class, what's exciting from my seat is that the greater the monetary base that grows within crypto, the more development work we see, the more use cases that get unlocked. And it kind of starts this really wonderful flywheel effect. Um, and that's the stuff that really gets us excited. 
Yeah, I would I would agree completely with that. I mean, we have a billion dollar index fund, right? I mean, that's that's professional investors who want broad based exposure to crypto. So I think two things are true. One, I think the ETF flows into the Bitcoin ETFs will continue for many years. I mean, the largest inflow into the gold ETF came in year sixteen, uh, to give you a, a thought. And it had eight straight years of significant inflows building every year. I see no reason why that would be different. But I also think diversified products uh, may end up being larger or as large as Bitcoin itself. It's just a matter of how long that takes. I think it could take multiple years. I mean, again, I think I agree with the panelists. I mean, the only other dynamic I think is important for people to think about is, is, is the, again, the catalyst, right? So we've... We've seen Bitcoin ETFs come to the market. That's creating a whole catalyst for other things to happen. I mean, you can see from a BlackRock perspective what we've filed for in the US. So clearly we, we think that there is opportunity and demand. But I think that there's a, a few different narratives that start to emerge here. So one is, as Bitcoin ETFs continue to peripherally and become more adept across the industry, does that start to change the narrative of Bitcoin itself? Like, does it get to the point where promise of an alternative store of value becomes more of a reality? Does the utility from an institutional perspective start to keep in? When we think about cross-border, open access, less risk from an inflationary perspective and so on. So I think you have that narrative around about Bitcoin. And I think there's a journey here that people need to think about, right, in terms of education across that new investor base and that new demographic that are coming in. So I think the industry has done a really good job to capture the imagination and capture the interest in Bitcoin. That will continue to be a catalyst. I think there's education that still needs to happen in terms of what really is Ethereum, what does it mean, how is it different and so on, that the industry is going to need to go through. But, I mean, clearly we're seeing the demand on one side, which I think leads to demand on the other side. And maybe, you know, as we're starting to wind down here, I think one, something that I've been wondering about a lot as we've... Uh, of these spot Bitcoin ETFs is one of the um, criticisms or potential risks around Bitcoin that's been levied against it for many years is that eventually the government is going to ban this, um, right? This is, you know, uh, some of our macro panelists earlier this morning alluded to that there was a period of time back in the 1930s, actually for about 40 years, uh, gold, holding gold was banned in the United States. Um, and one thing I've begun to wonder a little bit is now that Bitcoin has worked its way a little bit deeper into the existing financial system, and many U.S. Uh, you know retail and institutional investors actually own the asset. Does that make it less likely that it's ultimately going to end up getting banned? What do you What do you all think? Yeah, it's funny. Matt and I were talking about this last night. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, uh, for starters, the U.S. banning gold is is like a fake story. Uh, the U.S. was fake on, news. Fake news. The U, it is. The U.S. was on the gold standard. They wanted to do quantitative easing going into the depression. The only way you can do QE in a hard money system is to physically acquire gold. So the best way to do that was to seize it from all the private citizens. That was how the government expanded its gold stock so it could do the 1930s era equivalent of QE. It wasn't out of a hatred of gold or a worry about an alternative monetary system. So there's no precedent in the U.S. for uh, saying thou shalt not own this alternative monetary asset uh, absent QE. And actually, the U.S. is really good at doing QE right now. We have no, we have no issue with printing money regardless of Bitcoin. Um, so so I, I don't think that's true. I do think when you have millions of people owning it, when you have illustrious firms like the folks on this panel um, saying it's a legitimate asset class, I think it becomes difficult to vanishingly hard to actually ban it. So I think that risk has been diminished. I think broadly, the launch of Bitcoin ETFs have diminished many of the existential or near existential risks to Bitcoin and improved it as an asset. And this is one of the examples. I, I, I would add, add to that by saying that like there is always a wall of worry in Bitcoin and there's always something. And in different client segments have different walls of worry. And to your point, at some point, it's about terrorism financing. At some point, it's the government's going to ban it. Um, I would actually say that we're now beginning to see folks, and Matt and I spoke about this at, at dinner last night, actually take, take a look and say, well, why don't I have Bitcoin in my portfolio? I'm concerned about the US debt uh, situation. What asset do I have in my portfolio that helps you there? Or secondly, I might hate Bitcoin, but I love my shop. 
and here is it, here it is in a wrapper, which I recognize. And if I just put that into, into the model, it improves my sharp. And at, at Galaxy, we, we ran a, a research report showing that called get, get off zero. If you go from zero to one percentage point of, of Bitcoin in your portfolio, it increases your sharp uh, um, like measurably. And, and so I think you'll begin, begin, I think you'll begin to see a, a bunch of folks actually move away from this concern about, about the government's going to ban it and instead say, hey, by the way, why is this not in my portfolio already? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, the only other thing I would say is, like, I think, I think ETFs them, themselves have actually changed the narrative significantly, right? You think about some of the concerns that have been levied in the past from the, the way custody works, the providers in this space, the nuances of crypto in terms of the marketplace. We've actually solved a lot of those challenges through the advent of ETFs themselves. So a lot of the arguments in the past as to why Bitcoin and crypto assets were challenging for traditional investors, we've kind of we've kind of fixed a lot of that by wrapping it in the ETF. So I, I think that we're beyond that conversation now, to be perfectly honest, in a big part because of what we've done from an ETF perspective. Michael, you want to close us down here? Um, no pressure at all. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's largely right. I mean, for 10 years, uh, and certainly the earlier years, you know, we'd get laughed out of the room trying to talk to an institution about Bitcoin. And in terms of solving problems, you know, if you did go to a hedge fund or an endowment or a pension, they'd be like, sure, we'd love to buy some, but well, what if he doesn't work here any longer? Or what if he absconds with the private keys or whatever it may be, right? And so in many ways, you know, these types of um, investors utilize products like ETFs to get these types of exposures and the products are trading liquidly and with tight spreads and they can put on big positions and take off big positions and that's really what they look for. Um, and I think the final thing that um, just occurred to me as we we're talking up here is that, you know, today, you know, coming out of this most recent crypto winter, the, the lending space around crypto looks a lot different. Yeah. Um, and so you're seeing a lot of folks not, you know, still being long passively a lot of crypto assets, but certainly not um, engaging as often in lending activity to earn yield. Um, what's interesting about ETFs is that um, you can actually lend out shares of your ETF and earn a yield. And so that's also, I think, been another kind of attractive option, not just for folks that are crypto native, but even for folks that are just going to be passively long the ETF, um, that they can actually earn yield by lending out their shares. So another kind of important feature that ultimately is helping us to advance the ecosystem. All right, guys, that is all the time we have. Thank you so much for all your time. Guys, give our panelists a big round of applause.